Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, for those that have joined us, uh, we're going to talk to you today about our uh, white paper research journeys with unicorns. So my name is Simon. Um, I'm the CEO of Nomensa. I've been in the user experience game for um, two decades, and I think today we're going to share some pretty exciting stuff with you about how we uh, think about user experience with our clients and the kind of way that we try to get them to sort of think about it in terms of excellence. So we've got, um, good afternoon, my name is Alex Metcalf. I'm a UX consultant in Mensa. We've got the overview of the white paper, first of all, uh, looking about 20 to 30 minutes for that. And then we're going to have a Q&A session afterwards. We're going to have a couple of uh, methods we'll give you at the end of how you can submit some questions. But you've also got the chat interface as well, where you can submit questions as well. So just a bit about both of ourselves. I've been a UX consultant now for a pure, pure UX consultant for 15 years. My second master's was in uh, HCI back in 2001. And I help and advise and lead our clients on digital strategy and experience excellence. And yourself, Simon? So I'm the CEO of Nomensa. I founded the company back in um, early 2001, um, pretty much focused on sort of the kind of intersection between uh, human behavior and design. So <clears throat> I want to talk to you a little bit about why we did this research. So a lot of our clients ask us the question, you know, what what do we need to look at to understand what are the best examples um, to kind of copy or to emulate? And this is a really good question because user experience has is, is, is gone from being pretty um, unknown craft to now uh, arguably, arguably the most kind of um, demanded design discipline in the world. So it's very, very, very popular. And a lot of user experience tends to sort of focus still on the kind of either the visual, the sort of tactical elements of design. What we want to talk to you today is the more kind of strategic commercial elements. So that when our clients ask us this question, what should we be looking to do? We, we, you know, we thought, actually, this is a really good question. Um, yeah, we've been doing user experience for, for a very long time. There's a lot of people here that do it at the Mentor that have all been doing it for a very long time. But what can we really turn to? And when we started to think about it, we thought, well, who are the companies in the world that are demonstrating a level of experience excellence when it comes to user experience? And the, I think the main thing that people, uh, the, the easy trap to fall into is to start copying features and to look to the competition and be competing on uh, marginal price differences or feature sets. And that has a problem because they're easily copied, uh, especially in a world where technology is moving so quickly and the, the cost to implement new technology solutions is, very, is, is much lower than it used to be. Infrastructure for worldwide um, reaches is tending to zero. So you get the problem where people try and introduce new features and try to do something slightly different, but then it can be copied so quickly, like, uh, for example, Instagram adopting Snapchat features, such as the Stories uh, feature. And uh, Instagram's head of product earlier in the year said that this is the way the tech industry works. And it is, and it's understandable. And we do, we do have this proliferation of, of, of tick box features throughout the industry. So the question really comes when things are moving so quickly, how do you differentiate? And this is important because one has to think of it in terms of a balancing act. Well, that's how we think of it at Nomensa. Essentially, you're either uh, being or acting as a disruptor um, or you're being disrupted or trying to avoid disruption. And that's pretty much what is happening right now. There are many examples um, that, that people know of where um, technology has been um, collapsed or dematerialized. So, you know, for example, you know, Kodak, um, is a great example of a company that we all know of that was very advanced when it came to sort of digital photography, but um, they were kind of quickly superseded by um, a completely new uh, technology. 
and that and you know this is you know this is you know these sorts of things are very very interesting to understand and rather than just looking at it from the perspective of well what are the features that we need to copy we've kind of taken a step back and thought right what are the things that businesses do commercially to better choreograph kind of business and commercial value consumer value consumer propositions how do they do that how do they turn human behavior into meaningful design that allows them to deliver an experience and scale that experience quickly. There's a wonderful example of the importance of experience. June 29th, 2007, uh, Apple introduced the first iPhone. And a lot of people found this immensely frustrating in, in the industry because there were so many features it didn't have. It didn't have 3G, didn't have a camera, didn't have apps. You couldn't even, as some people said, copy and paste. So why was it received so well? Why did it um, cause um, such consternation from everyone from Steve Palmer at Microsoft to many other industry leaders? Because they put a relentless focus on the quality of the experience. The differentiator, if you've been seeing the keynote when the crowd reacted, when there was inertia in the scrolling where he flicked, Steve Jobs flicked his finger across the screen and the scrolling kept going and glided to a stop after he let go. It's commonplace now, but this was truly revolutionary at the time. And of course, then came the features after the fact when they got the core experience so solid and so correct. So experience truly became a differentiator and caught out many of the biggest people in the industry completely by surprise. And it's easy to get caught up thinking, well, actually, what we need to do is deliver a set of features or a set of functionality that is going to differentiate. And the kind of analogy that we tend to use with our clients is, if you imagine a cathedral, um, St. Paul's Cathedral, for example, and you deconstruct that cathedral into its um, component parts, windows, steel, bricks, et cetera, et cetera, and you put, you put that on the ground and you look at it from above, it's just a bunch of stuff. However, when you combine it together, it becomes a cathedral. And this is the point that it's the combination or the orchestration mm -hmm. of features which actually delivers a great compelling experience. So Apple is one obvious example. And you think what are the class of companies now in 2017 that are really understanding this and are able to deliver amazing experience and to scale it really well? We'll come back to that concept. But the group of companies is unicorns. And a unicorn, here's a great quote from Investopedia. Unicorn, if you don't know it, a term from I believe 2013 was its first use. In the world of business, a company, usually a startup, that does not have an established performance record with a stock market valuation or estimated, value, estimated valuation of more than $1 billion. And so, Simon, this means that what can they do with this reach and with this ability? It means, ultimately, that they're able to deliver an experience at scale, that through digital, through the large addressable markets that, that, that are um, accessible to them, they're able to design an experience and scale that. And that is essentially a very differentiating factor in comparison to the kind of incumbents that existed before that. So a lot of people will say um, Apple ush ushered in this idea of, say, responsive design or um, cross-channel or omni-channel interaction. They did something much, much deeper than that. They moved computing from something that was done at work or at home to something that was done 24-7. And that created a global inflection, which then, in, you know, which a load of companies thought, right, do you know what? We can design an experience for hoteling, for communications, for all manner of things. And this is why we think that the unicorn businesses represent a very good guide to understanding how to deliver experience excellence. And if you look at the graph, what's quite, what's quite interesting here is that you can see a few businesses in kind of Q1 2009, kind of this is literally 18 months after the launch of, of the iPhone. And if you kind of fast forward to sort of Q4 2016, the number of unicorns that exist is, is, is much, much, much more. We know right now that unicorn businesses are um, emerging in many different sectors, not just technology, in many different sectors. And we think this is the beginning of something quite interesting. 
if you imagine less than, as we say, 10 years ago, which was the time that the iPhone came out, there were kind of maybe around 10 unicorns. Today, this is very, very different. There is, you know, we're talking about almost 300 exist. So this is, this represents some, a global change, a massive global change. And it would be kind of prudent for us to be aware as kind of experienced designers, how we can tap into the insights that these companies can reveal to us to help our clients also emulate some of the great things that they do. So what we did in this research, we took six unicorns and picked out six experience characteristics that exemplify the way they've taken a stranglehold globally on really interesting uh, paradigms, on really interesting ways of revisiting old problems and taking advantage of technology in well, it, quite extraordinary ways. And we're going to cover them off. I don't want to lead too much in this, but we're going to cover off a key summary of these six unicorns now. And there's loads more detail on the white paper, which hopefully you will have all received or will be receiving in your email inbox as well. And please let us know after checking junk mails and so forth if it hasn't come through. But let's start with the first one, and that is Uber. Now, obviously, there's um, the element in the room of, of, of some of the, the ethical, moral aspects uh, of being hugely newsworthy, especially in this year. And we're not dismissing that, but in the essence of what Uber and similar companies have been able to achieve is in, in a way separate from that. When you look at their valuation, almost $63 billion, having uh, delivered over 5 billion rides, and to get a sense of the scale of growth on that, the first billion rides took five years to achieve, but the, the next four billion rides took less than 18 months. And it's the perfect convergence of technologies. And Simon, you want to talk about what they've been able to do for the value proposition? Yeah, so one of the big things that we, that, that, that we get asked or we help our kind of clients understand is the link between value proposition and the kind of user experience that, that, that they want to or need to design. Um, and we try to make it quite transparent here because when you think about Uber, the, the kind of value proposition is the transformation of experience through um, saving in times and effort. Now, this isn't specific to just Uber. When you look across many of the unicorn businesses and the six that we're going to talk about, we see this kind of thing kind of re-emerging again and again and again. But what is important here is that here is an organization that took a traditional um, supply-led um, business model, turned it on its head through on-demand thinking. And that, that is, that's quite unique. And there's many businesses that are kind of em emulating that now. And the way that we like to kind of explain it is, is through, um, through a customer journey. So here's an example of a traditional taxi journey across the top of this diagram. You know, you phone them up, you share your location as best you can describe it, and destination, you wait for pickup and hope their estimate is right. You take the journey and they hope you've got the right payment at the end of it. There's many classic steps. And if you look at some of the savings and how the GPS in your phone can identify exactly where you are, you can use mapping to get the optimal route for the taxi driver to the destination. You can have payment information ready in the app so that payments handle automatically. And so you look at the bottom of those three uh, journeys with Uber, you've just got four simple steps. Open the app, share your destination, wait for the pickup, take the journey. With so many ambiguous, um, um, ambiguity and uncertainties taken out and so many other features they add on top of that from ride splitting, uh, sorry, affair splitting to um, services they provide and journey. So it's been an extraordinary upheaval of a classic journey and technology has enabled this transformation and this company such as Uber and Lyft and, and many others taking full advantage. And, and just, just to sort of kind of build, you know, build, build on that point, it's not the features that they have because you know, in, in, in recent months they've kind of added this ability to, to, to give a tip. Um, it's the fact that they add features which add significant value to the overall experience. Mm -hmm. They're not in a feature war, they're in an experience war. It's a very different way of thinking about how you design digital technology. So Spotify next up. 
fascinating example of a huge amount of data. True, true example of big data. 140 million active users and more, and 50 petabytes of production storage, which is many zeros, I believe it's 15 zeros after it, more than 2 billion playlists. They work in a space of huge data. But Simon, beyond it being this massive amount of data they're processing, what is the value proposition here? Humanistic insights from big data. Well, what does that mean? If you take, for example, the discovery feature, and I'm, I'm, I love Spotify. We all love discovering new, new music. They've made that literally so convenient, like Uber have made um, getting a cab, a click, Spotify have made discovering new music the same. This is the point. They've, it's not just a simplica simplification of the user experience, it's a choreography of human behavior integration with unbelievable amounts of data that deliver something truly amazing, something truly discoverable. And that's kind of, for us, the thing that differentiates them. I mean, this is a company that um, absolutely demonstrates excellence in machine learning. And the beautiful thing is they realized early on that um, once you can handle this amount of data, how do you get these insights? So in 2014, they acquired the Echo Nest, a music intelligence company. There was a fantastic uh, quote from uh, Spotify CEO Daniel Eck at the time. He said, at Spotify, we want to get people to listen to more music, and we are hyper-focused on creating the best user experience. And it starts with building the best music intelligence platform on the planet. So all the features you see uh, to this day, such as um, Discover Weekly and Release Radar and so forth, they are, as described by one of their engineers in the blog, the tip of the personalization iceberg. They put a massive investment into machine learning models and sharing that insight within the company. And out comes the result that hopefully you go to uh, the Discover feature and actually it finds music that you actually like. And that simple human interpretation, it discovers something new, takes a huge amount of thought and care and time into the experience and the processing of the information to get those insights. And if you kind of take it a step further and start to think about the fact that, um, it, it, you know, you, you could say, right, we want to copy Spotify. Well, that's going to be pretty difficult because it's this choreography and this absolute commitment to understanding that human beings want to discover new music that, that actually sets their experience apart from all others. And this is, you know, this is the kind of stuff that we are kind of looking for, the kind of insights that we're trying to discover and share with our clients. How can you get a perspective on what to truly do with this big data? Well, Spotify is a, the, the perfect example of that. So Airbnb, another famous unicorn. A uh, $31 billion estimated valuation in 65,000 cities around the world. And you can see on that graph on the right, the growth has been extraordinary. So that's a graph showing summer travel, if the resolution is not showing it for you. Grown 353 times in just five years. A classic uh, up and to the right graph, if ever you saw one. And it's something that can't be emulated uh, when you have physical constraints. Simon, do you want to talk about the value proposition they bring to the table? Yeah, so this kind of seamless, incentivized onboarding experience. This is, you know, this is the kind of thing that, that we've seen before with the likes of, say, uh, Google AdWords. You're talking about a completely automated, um, non-human non innovation-based system that allows su su you know, super fast acquisition um, and onboarding. The kind of effect of that is, is that the kind of acquisition and onboarding costs kind of create this network effect that the more people that you take on, the lower and lower and lower and lower and lower the cost goes. It's really, really powerful. It's kind of one of the things that we think, you know, sa you know separates out the, the, the big digital uh, di disruptors from everyone else. This ability to automate a process completely. And so here's an example, a screenshot from the current site. As, as Simon said, they've, they've really extracted the employees of Airbnb from the onboarding process. You can sign up in a fully automated way. Network effects, 
the improvement of the service as more people join. So as more hosts become available, more people wanting to find a room join the service. And because more people wanting to find the room join the service, more hosts become available. It's a beautiful balance that starts to improve the quality of the overall experience. One interesting aspect around scaling experience is that you can't build it in as some magic automated thing from the start because so many of the nuances of experience come into play. Like people becoming familiar with the service and as a uh, CEO of Airbnb, Brian Chesky noted, it's a different, ex different problem they had to some other businesses because people in one city needed to have uh, access to rooms in another city. So you couldn't go city by city necessarily and build up the same way. So some wonderful stories you can find um, on many articles on the internet about how, for example, when they started off, uh, Chesky would go around the CEO of the company to individual hosts' houses and help them take professional photographs. Completely unscalable solution, but it started the ball rolling and started that development of the customer base, which then you can set off for the kind of growth we saw on the previous slide. And that, and, and, and this is a really interesting insight to share because we, we believe in what we think that we worked out is the first thing you need to do is to define what the experience needs to be. And you need to work on that until you're absolutely certain that you have it. And then you scale it. This is very, you know, this is very different to what typically happens at the moment. I mean, there's still consensus that you can kind of um, agile your way to develop the right experience. Well, I think that if you look at these companies and this, and, and this research, I mean, what we would argue is that these companies have invested heavily in working out what their experience should be. And then they set about scaling that experience. So before we come on to Slack, just to say, if you want to submit questions to us for when we get to the end here, um, you can either use the interface in the, uh, the webinar, uh, the chat interface, or you can use the hashtag journeys with unicorns on Twitter. So the hashtag journeys with unicorns and let us know anything that we can answer at the end. So Slack, wonderful example. We actually have, um, I, I hope I'm not going to jump ahead too much and say we have a, a, an article coming out about that and some extra value that they bring. But $3.8 billion valuation uh, and a wonderful proposition where they've really brought something new um, because we're so used to talking about uh, understanding user needs and then iterating on that and delivering something. But Simon, do you want to talk about the value proposition that and, the, and the, the, the unique situation they faced coming into the market. Yeah, I kind of, you know, think, you know, thinking about Slack reminds me a lot, of, a lot of many of the kind of great, you know, great sound bites and quotes that would come from Steve Jobs. Um, but then, you know, their kind of value, you know, their value proposition around delivering um, experience excellence in a completely new market. This isn't something that you could go and ask people what to do, because um, you know, it's 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 like that kind of. It's, it's like, you know, when, 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 when Ford would ask people, well, what do people need? Well, they just need faster horse and carts, yeah? So it's kind of, this is something completely, utterly new. And it lends itself so beautifully to digital in all ways. This is a way to choreograph something that didn't exist or probably wouldn't have existed before digital. And people wouldn't have thought of it before digital. And one of the ways that they do what they do, and we're able to basically define this new market, is with the concept of feedback loops. Now, feedback loops, taking the feedback that any number of ways that, that your customers or clients give it to you, and then iterating the service that you offer, and then listening some more. These are fairly well established as an idea, and if you're not doing that in some formal way, uh, it's something we help uh, a lot of our, our clients develop, and it's extremely important. But in this case, you're also taking the feedback from users. You are adjusting the service, and then you're also shaping the proposition. You're changing the messaging of what you're offering because nobody knew in the first place exactly what this was going to evolve into. So really tight iterative feedback loops where every single bit, as you can see the quotes on the screen from uh, Slack CEO Stuart Butterfield, we can take user feedback any way we can get it. Take it all and treasure it. 
that old adage of if one person says it, then 10 people were experiencing it themselves and didn't say anything. Treat it all like gold dust. And again, even to this day, you try and send a tweet to Slack on Twitter or reach out in some way, they respond and quickly. And uh, it's a tribute to this fundamental approach built into the company. Yeah, I think, you know, pe you know people will say, well, you know, what does feedback represent? Feedback and specifically this level of feedback, this deeply integrated level of feedback represents excellence in user experience design. It is essentially a demonstration of an organization's ability to listen and respond based on what people are saying. And it is a trend that is very common now within um, the kind of startup industry. It's something that will define the types of experiences that organizations want to make. And it's this type of um, listening as, as, as well that kind of really saves Slack because Slack didn't start out, did it, Alex, as um, the kind of integrated uber communications tool it is today. No, the original company was, was tiny spec that a game called Glitch, which unfortunately closed in 2012. And the, 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 the starting point of Slack was this um, internal communications tool they developed. And they kept on a core team to build up this tool and to commercialize it. So it really was a, a beautiful phoenix from the ashes story. And again, um, I might as well say this, the, 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 the next article in our strategic UX series in our blog is going to talk about this in more detail. So uh, yeah, it's, definitely I mean, check it out. I mean, we learn, you know, we're big, you know, we're big, we're big fans of Slack here. Um, and I also think it, it's, it's, it's such a, you know, we, you know that Slack is powerful when, for example, you know, my, you know, Microsoft adds the same sort of functionality to their technology. You know, this is, you know, this goes back to what we were saying previously about defending disruption. So these, you know, the, you know, the kind of technological incumbents that kind of um, precede the kind of unicorn businesses, you know, the, the, you know, the ones that are taking note, look at what they're doing and go, do you know what? We need to make sure that we can deliver a similar experience with similar technology because otherwise we've got a very good chance of them disrupting us. So we've got a couple of unicorns to look at, maybe about five to ten minutes of, of our review of the white paper. Again, any questions put them through and hashtag uh, journeys with unicorns as well, something like this to cover after the fact. We work, wonderful example because, I mean apart from that, again, these astronomical valuations and successes, 20 billion, and a wonderful quote there from the chief product officer saying user experiences need to be baked into every aspect of what we do. And they treat user experience as a holistic concept across physical and digital, which is going to be an ever increasing way to look at experience ongoing, especially as our markets in augmented reality and Internet of Things uh, flourish. But Simon, the reason we got WeWork in this is about the organizational structure and maybe you can talk a bit about that. Yeah, so you know the kind of value, you know, the, the value value proposition here is putting experience at the heart of the organizational structure. Here's a business that is actually delivering office space that is kind of is, is integrated digital and physical ways of thinking and acting. If you imagine that they've kind of broken down how you would actually interact with, with their organization into a number of journeys represented by a number of teams, this is very, very clever thinking. So, you know, in, in, in the UX world, in the design world, we talk about journey design. Well, here's an example of how you deliver journey design, not just to say deliver a better journey, but deliver a better business customer journey. This is a much deeper collaboration. This is, the, you know, this is a very interesting way to look at it. I mean, it's a great example because when people say, well, we're not a digital company, we don't do digital stuff. We just say, well, look at WeWork, look at what they've done. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, uh, a really beautiful example in Pinterest, uh, the idea of the personalized experience. And I'll let Simon speak to that in a minute. But again, um, 
foreshadowing slightly what we're going to come to in a minute, but a lot of data they're working with, 75 billion plus pins, um, $12.3 billion valuation. Uh, a wonderful company built around discovery and the importance of discovery in our information-saturated world. So we have this wealth of information. And Simon, speak about, uh, to us about the, how that is personalized down to every single user. So what, what we love about Pinterest is that the design is, is very atomic. So you've got this kind of classic card-based design. So there's a very high level uh, of user experience hygiene. It's very visually rich. But when you imagine what we're talking about is collections of um, images, suggestions, things that you can discover. And this is a way of making, as, as Alex has said, the, the, the overwhelming amount of information that we have today, which is only going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and turning it into something that feels manageable. This is personalization excellence. This is the, the, the you know, we believe that this demonstrates a level of personal experience design that firms should be looking to emulate everywhere. And a wonderful quote, Ben Silverman, CEO of Pinterest. Um, he talks about uh, Pinterest being new time, as, as, and there's lots of really beautiful insights he has if you want to research more, and there's many in the white paper as well. But this quote, a lot of ads really suck and they're really ugly. They detract from the experience, but you want promoted pins to fill out the ideas you want to make your own. So you're looking at how can every part of this experience be yours? And you've got the features such as Pinterest Lens, which they introduced at the start of this year, where you point your cameras, uh, your phone's camera at an item and it will actually give you suggestions of pins based on what it detects using uh, machine learning and some other um, advanced tools. And they've also done a lot of work on personalized emails, the end of bulk marketing emails, so that every email is tailored exactly to that user and things they're interested in. So it's a holistic approach, um, hyper-focused on a personal experience, um, a beautiful contrast to the, the billions and millions that you know they deal with um, being a hugely successful unicorn. So hopefully that, that gave you a kind of um, a, a, a feel for uh, some of the insights that we've kind of been covered and shared from the kind of unicorn research. Um, and and we, we know that the kind of value propositions that we've kind of teased out aren't specific to say one unicorn. You know, there are many unicorns right now and many organizations that, that are exploring machine learning, that are exploring personalization that are really trying to get a handle on how are we going to help our customers manage this overbearing amount of information that they have to deal with. And it's kind of, it's, it's, it's thinking in these ways and trying to look at the best companies that are kind of delivering at experience at scale that we look to when we're thinking about the kind of work that, that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Given how accessible technology makes a lot of um, capabilities and how we have a global reach. The, the pressures have increased in a way that we've never seen before and it's, it, it's not unrealistic to say if it's not you taking advantage of some of these trends, it really is the competitors. There is somebody out there ready to move and yet if you imbue your entire proposition and everything you do as a company rich with uh, a commitment to experience excellence, it's not easy to copy. It becomes that long-term differentiator. So what we'd argue is that the best way to deliver experience excellence is firstly to define what the experience needs to be before you even attempt to scale it. That is the first thing that you need to do. And we think that these six unicorns absolutely exemplify that. You don't get to be a unicorn without having a user experience which is excellent and you have to be able to deliver that experience at scale, millions of users. The, this is very, very tricky. I mean, to put it in a nutshell, it's never been easier to deliver a digital experience. However, it's never been harder to deliver an excellent user experience.
here's a, a few other bits and pieces that you might want to kind of have a uh, have 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 a think about. So we kind of run events, we do other research. You can come to our blog, Humanizing Technology. Um, if you want to kind of share our our um, white paper around, please please do you know please do do that. And if you know if anyone has any questions that they want to ask us now. You know, this is a really good opportunity to do to do that. Alternatively, um, you know, email us and 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 we will follow up with any questions that you may have. Yeah, I think um, looking at our, our our marketing guys here, we haven't any questions at this moment, but please send them through to us. There's ways to contact us on the screen. You've got hello at immense.com to reach out to us. We're going to have the white paper freely available. Should be with you. Uh, the blog will have a series of articles tying into these unicorns on strategic UX. So please check that out as well. And beyond that, I would say thank you very much for your time on behalf of Nemensa. Yeah, thank you very much. We, we hope you've enjoyed it. And we'll give a minute just to spot for any questions. And then if not, we will look forward to hearing from you. Yeah, just talking to the guys. We've had some questions through which are a bit more specific and it'd be warrant to more of a one-on-one -on -one answer. So please get in touch with us um, at a later date with anything else. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you.